Gathering data is arguably the core of all research using the scientific method of problem solving, and the most fundamental part of good data collection is validity and reliability. But them's the basics, and it wouldn't be grad school if we got to stop there. Otherwise, we might get a chance to sleep. Can't have that! So let's crack these two nuts open and see why researchers across the land can always find a reason to fight. Validity is the concept that your test is measuring what you say it's measuring, and it's comprised of four basic types. Logical, content, criterion, and construct. These are what I'll be talking about, but fittingly, not all scientific associations agree to these four basic types. You can claim logical validity when your measurement is obviously involving the performance you're measuring. A 100 meter sprint test very obviously measures performance in a 100 meter sprint. A 1 rep max test in the back squat is very logically going to test your back squat strength. However, logical validity isn't going to get you very far outside of the lab, so researchers often have to find more objective methods of measurements other than just pointing at what you're doing and going, see? Content validity usually pertains to some sort of educational setting, and will tell you whether or not a test accurately reflects what was taught in a course. It's less straightforward than logical validity, but generally they'll try to get a group of experts to come to a consensus of what I forgot to highlight in my book in the weeks before an exam, and they'll put that on the test. Criterion validity uses some higher authority as a benchmark for comparison. This could be an organization, or some sort of generally accepted gold standard of measurement, or even future behaviors. For example, let's say you don't want to use the gold standard for measuring body fat, which is hydrostatic weighing, just because it's too cost prohibitive and takes up too much time. What you could do instead is take a small sample of your participants, have them go through both hydrostatic weighing and the much easier and drier skinfold calipers, compare the results you get between the two, and then you validated your easier method with the gold standard. The last type is construct validity, and it's definitely the toughest to establish. A construct is something that exists because we say it exists and we're reasonably certain that we can differentiate between its presence and its absence. This is particularly relevant in the study of human behavior, where we know things like creativity and anxiety are things, we just can't touch them or measure them directly. So instead we have to find roundabout ways of getting at them. For example, we could use something called the known group differences method, which takes two groups that we're really sure are different in this one trait and devise a system that consistently categorizes them correctly. Without direct means of measurement, it can be really hard to establish construct validity. I mean, after all, it's not like there's some sort of tube that you can stick in someone's ear and it'll tell you their agreeableness. Well, actually, if they, if they let you stick a tube in their ear, it could... Hold on, I'm gonna write that down. Before you hate on the subjectivity of construct validity, know that it's pretty much the granddaddy of all the other forms of validity. After all, validity itself is a construct, and like all scientific truths, it comes down to consensus. Something is valid if we all agree it's valid. There's a good chance you'll hear me screaming that as security escorts me from the dean's office, but that doesn't make it any less true. Something all of those validity types have in common is their reliance on reliability. Reliability is how consistent and repeatable we find a measurement to be. Validity and reliability have kind of a square circle thing going on. Uh, you can have a test that is reliable but not valid, but you can't have a test that is valid without being reliable. For example, if your bathroom scale always adds 15 pounds, we might say it's reliable because 200 will always read as 215, but we wouldn't call it valid because it's not accurately measuring how much you actually weigh. It isn't. At the heart of reliability is minimizing errors during the data collection process. Theoretically, there exists a true score of any measurement, where the stars align and the perfect number is handed down from Mount Olympus completely free of all error. But unless you hear harps when your MATLAB script finishes running, you're probably going to be stuck with what's called an observed score, which is that mythical perfect score, plus or minus all the errors you definitely made. Measurement error can come from a lot of different sources at every single step in the scientific process. Your participants might not be very motivated, and therefore they're going to give you lower results on your data. The GA configuring your cameras might be nursing a hangover. Or your department's computers might still use punch cards. Basically, any time care or attention slips even a little bit, it can produce a measurement error. Fortunately, we have ways of testing for that. You can run the same test a bunch of different times in a row, like doing five reps of a vertical jump test to make sure they're all pretty similar. You can use two different exams on the same group of students to make sure the scores are pretty close to one another or you can repeat a test on a different day and measure its stability. The ultimate goal here is the pursuit of objectivity. Here, objectivity is defined as the degree to which another tester can achieve the same results. But we can expand that definition to say that an objective test is one free from all biases, human or not. Research into human behavior has to be especially careful with this sort of thing. For example, if an observer has to classify an action as either A or B, they're going to be relying on their own personal judgment, which always carries the risk of being influenced by your personal beliefs and experiences. Think about referees who have to classify every movement as either legal 
or illegal. They might all be going off the same rulebook, but even at the highest levels, there's always going to be some intertester variability. Unless you're Duke. This variability is known as observer bias error. In fact, since measuring human behavior often necessitates the use of things like sliding scales, even with your best efforts to remain as objective as possible, pitfalls are just inherent to the process. Things like leniency, or its evil twin, central tendency error, might skew an observer's records away from being too mean to a participant, for instance. These errors can be minimized by either extensively training all the raiders in your study, or selling your soul for grant money. That's not to say that movement science or any hard science is completely free from subjectivity during the research process. Belief perseverance is a well-studied phenomenon, thanks social sciences, and it can take the form of the halo effect or observer expectation errors no matter what you're studying. If you did every step in the research process up to this point by the book, this book specifically, it means you've delved into literature enough to identify independent and dependent variables, and by extension, what you think's probably going to happen to them. When you've spent all that time and effort formulating a hypothesis, it's really hard not to be looking for it when the day comes to collect your data. Basically, if you went into a test thinking a specific protocol was going to increase muscle force on a uh, dynamic max effort sprint test, for example, and the day comes, and those numbers aren't going up like you thought they would, it takes a pretty steel will not to encourage that participant just a little bit louder. Unless you got that grant money from earlier. Even if you think the concept of objectivity is a myth, looking at you, Polanyi, we can still strive to minimize human and environmental biases as much as possible during the data collection process. If we can consistently control conditions to the point where different testers on different days are getting really similar results using the same measurement, we can say that that measurement is reliable. If a measurement is reliable, that opens up the possibility that it can help us answer what we asked in the first place. If our tests say what we think they say, that gives them validity. And when our tests are reliable and our measurements are valid, that makes us feel really good when we hand that data off to a stats grad so they can do all the hard work.